Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Willem Sandlad, co-founder and CEO of Odin Technologies. And I'm going to try to talk about two things. Uh, one, uh, what are the lessons learned from starting an IoT company? There might be others in the place that we were in a couple of years ago, and what are some things that you should focus on? And the other thing is the most important sector in the US economy, manufacturing. It's easy to forget how big of a role manufacturing plays in our lives today because we live in, in large cities and a lot of our friends or families aren't in manufacturing because it's not as big, big of a part of the workforce in the US anymore. But on any given car, or also actually a lot of people that I meet, um, they feel like the problems of manufacturing may already be solved because what we see from manufacturers are the shiny factories of Tesla or of, of Toyota or Rolls-Royce, but we forget that a normal car coming from someone like Toyota is made up of 30,000 components coming from thousands of different manufacturers in a tight supply chain, and they're all making those different components, and those nice shiny factories are the ones where they are assembled with robotics. But if you look at U.S. manufacturing, it's still huge. Gross output of U.S. manufacturing in 2015 was $6.2 trillion dollars or 36% of the US gross domestic product. And that's broken up into many different segments. So look at our first target market, the ones where we sell our product to, is US plastics industry. And even plastics industry, just how you make different components out of plastics, is 16,000 factories in the US alone, with a combined output of $370 billion. And we look at how you're measuring efficiency in factories. There's nothing that's changed today from what it was 100 years ago. Everyone's still trying to make more with less, make as much output with the inputs that they have. You can break that out into a couple different pillars. So you have your availability. How much of your time are you actually able to spend making products? Out of that time, are you making it as fast or as efficient as you could? And then out of those products, how many were actually good? How many passed Q8? How many are good enough to go to your customers? And if you look at those three pillars as percentages of what it could be, so your acceptance rate, how much you made compared to how much you thought you were going to make, and how much time you, will, you spent compared to how much you could have spent, um, there's a combined metric when you take those different figures together called overall equipment efficiency. And world-class factories are in the 85s, so in the high 90s, or 95 and above on each of those pillars. The reality is that most factories in the entire world are in between their 30s and 60s, meaning that they can double their efficiency or more than double their output with the existing capital equipment that they have. They just don't know how they should be running their processes. So that's why it's not that surprising that if you look at the entire IoT opportunity, the largest value creation in IoT is actually going to happen in factories. And where that's coming from is solving those key things. Making sure that you can use your assets more, making sure that you use your raw materials as much as possible, or making sure that you don't have any bad quality products. And also making sure that your engineers or your executives or operators in those factories are as efficient as you can. So that's what we focus on. We try to provide manufacturers with the power to eliminate the waste, increase their output, using their most underutilized assets. Because if you look at those, um, the kind of long tail of manufacturing, we call them sometimes the 99% of manufacturing, they don't really have new equipment. They have old equipment, they have many different systems. Most of it is not enabled to be smart or to collect data. So all they're using is clipboards and timers to understand how they should be making their products. So we've built a device that can connect to all those pieces of equipment, even old ones, and an analytics platform that the engineers, executives, and operators at the factories use to eliminate their waste. So by digitizing 80% of the world's factories to leverage production data, that's the kind of 80% of the factories who aren't data enabled, who aren't smart enabled. So you have to, if you actually look at the environments that we go out into, it's not the newest environments, um, we've connected to machines that are in the 60s or, or from the 60s or 70s even to collect data. But using our device, um, they can now enable those um, machines to be analyzed and optimized um, using, well, 
anywhere they want, on any platform, on a tablet, on a computer, or wherever they want. So one of the most important lessons that we've learned in this part of our architecture, on the hardware side of things, is that try to stay um, focused on using off-the-shelf and open source components as long as you can. Because the question is, how long do you have to wait before you have perfect information? That's a trick question, because you'll never have perfect, inter perfect information. You're going to have to iterate many different times on understanding what your hardware solution looks like. If we had started right off the bat with building our own device with our assumptions that we had three years ago and setting up a supply chain in China, we probably would have never gone to market. But actually leveraging, in our case, a Raspberry Pi, and a lot of other open source solutions and components, we were able to bring our product to market very quickly and prove what we actually needed to prove. What does the customer care about? Do you actually solve the problem for them? Are you delivering value? And then you can focus on how you scale that or how you cut cost. And it all depends on what constraints you have as a hardware company as well. If you're in our environments, or think of a lot of hardware companies, they have constraints on size, on cost, or on power. But if you're working in the enterprise or if you're working in the industrial sector, size is not an issue because it gets plugged into one of these old cabinets and then it's shut. Power, you always have power. And also, cost is so much smaller than anything else that they could have expected, so it's just a write-off. The legacy or sort of incumbent solution from connecting machinery in the manufacturing world costs thousands of dollars, called PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. And even now, we're still using Raspberry Pis, and we're actually seen in the industry that that's not a blocker. We thought for a long time that people were going to look at it as a hobbyist tool, um, but actually we've seen it in many sales processes where they themselves are think it's cool. They they're kind of they understand how that cut their costs and they understand how we can actually deliver this at such a faster rate or more cost efficient rate. Because the flip side is they're going to buy a PLC from Siemens for over thousands of dollars, and even the large companies. We actually met the CTO of Siemens um, a couple of months ago. They're working with Raspberry Pis too, because they realize that that's where the market is going. They have something that has a functioning supply chain and great quality. That goes to the next part of the architecture. So when you're doing an IoT company, you, all, you always have a lot of different moving parts, from the hardware to the connectivity to the entire backend to whatever um, end user uh, application you're building. And the only thing that's important is, is that end user application actually delivering value to the customer? Are you solving the problem that you set out to solve? Because the customer in the end, they don't care about the plumbing as long as it's secure and scalable. So for us, we took the philosophical decision of what are we going to focus our, our resources on? How, what people are we going to hire? And how are we going to build this? And what, what is important for us as a business? We realized the same thing we did on the hardware side, on the software side, that using a lot of open source technologies and also a lot of leveraged, managed services will allow us to scale this much more efficiently. And we can focus on what focus our people and time on what matters to our customers in the end. So we've built this whole thing on Google Cloud Platform, where we ingest data using Google Cloud PubSub. Um, we collect millions of data points per production line per day, so we needed something that, could, that was very reliable and that can scale easily without hiring out an entire or a very large data engineering organization. Our data pipeline lives in Container Engine, so hosted Kubernetes, and then our data storage in Cloud Bigtable. And then our application itself is built in React, um, and then we have sort of, um, that lives in con Compute Engine, and all the microservices that support it lived in Container Engine. But the key to understand is, what are your customers actually looking for? And then work your way back and for how you can get there as fast as possible. Because the optimizations that you might be looking at on the hardware side or on the back end side, they're probably not going to be a problem until you actually hit scale. And when you hit scale, you have a much bigger team, so it's an easier problem to solve then. So what does this mean for the customers then? We actually have a customer who managed to they found an opportunity to increase their efficiency with 133% of one of the most complex products. 
and they're now in the process of executing that insight that they found through the platform. But a lot of what they're doing is understanding either what went wrong when they were making products so they can stop that from happening again, retrain the operators and change their sort of best operating procedures, or understanding or eliminating the variability across shifts, across operators, across production lines. So understanding how do I get up to optimal production as fast as possible, how should the operators be running this product, and by that reducing change over time by 33%, and giving them an, an additional 3,500 potential production hours per year. But the key with all of this and everything that we're kind of innovating on and new features that we're building, it's all about getting the right data into the right people's hands as fast as possible so they can take better decisions faster. That's how we feel like we can empower manufacturers to unlock that hidden smart factory. And that's actually all I had prepared. So we can go for questions. Questions where this is on? For questions where this awkward looking so <laughs> Um, tell us about the, the reality of selling um, in this market. What, what is the level of um, openness and interest in how quickly do people move uh, in the sort of industry from a customer's standpoint? Yep. Um, from a customer's point, um, the industry is really starting to wake up to this notion of Industry 4.0 or Industrial Internet of Things. So customers are coming to us with a kind of open blanket of, I need to innovate, I need to collect data, but they don't really know what, what or why, which is not something that we like. So we try to direct them to understanding what that ROI use case is. So we actually dive deep into understanding what the constraints of the business is. If they are you know, running 24 seven and their production constraint, meaning if they could make more, they could sell more, then we focus usually on increasing their availability. And we figure out, okay, if we can solve, if we can reduce your change over times by 50%, that's going to give them a potential X number of hundreds of thousand dollars in, in ROI for them. Um, because then we have a clear Pathfinder mission. They know why they're buying it, and we know exactly what data we're collecting. So we, make, we try to make it very focused on the ROI, um, because otherwise they're going to churn if they don't get the ROI. And we need to know how large that is. Okay. Are there certain parts of the industry, certain segments, certain verticals really interested in moving faster? Yes, absolutely. If you look at the larger industrial Internet of Things landscape, the ones who have moved the fastest have been aviation, oil and gas, utilities, more continuous processes where they've had a lot of money previously. So not at all where we've been focusing. <laughs> we've been in plastics manufacturing. Um, there you're seeing where the products are um, very valuable where they have very picky customers, they're gonna be way more aligned with what we're doing. So medical applications, military applications, or people selling into automotives, because they need to continuously improve their products. We had uh, one sales process right now where they're selling to very, very picky customers, actually into data centers, so some of the largest technology companies. And they know that they need to continuously increase throughput, so they're tightening the tolerances every single year on the cables that they make, and so they need to continuously change the way they're making that product all the time to meet demand. Okay. And maybe help, help us um, understand, uh, there's been a number of industrial giants that have been in that general space for a long time, right? The mm -hmm. Schneider Electric, yep. uh, Siemens, all the uh, OT versus IT, all operational technology. Yep. How, how does a, a startup position against, I mean, do you position against those people? Are you complementary? How do you think about those large companies? Yeah, that's, I mean, in, in all of our sales processes right now, we're up against Rockwell Automation or Siemens or those large incumbents. And for that, we know that just by the way we've built it, um, leveraging the cloud, leveraging a lot of managed services and also our open source hardware, we can usually beat them at 50% of the cost, the total cost of ownership. But that's not really the selling point we're trying to make. The selling point is that it gives them a lot more power because the reality is that all those legacy providers haven't kept up with the technological advancements that have happened in the past 15, 20 years. So they can't deliver 
um, something as quickly or scalable as this, and they're not really future-proofing it because they won't be able to add in machine learning, artificial intelligence, or other types of features that we're currently working on. Okay, great. There's a question over there. First here, and then. Thanks. <laughs> uh, how are you dealing with data issues, security issues, or have you gotten questions about that from potential customers? Yes, every, every single time. Um, it is one of the first questions that we get from manufacturers because after all, the data that we're collecting is their intellectual property, it's how they make their products. And so small factories, they usually kind of just say, how do you do it? And we tell them how we do it and they trust us. The larger companies, we've just gone through a big security audit with a Fortune 200 company. They have many different questionnaires and they ask us about really everything from how we do our identity and access management, how we do our internal processes, everything. Um, so that's top of mind for every manufacturer. <clears throat> the companies that you're helping have had already implemented something to continuously improve their processes, one would hope. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> what was it that you were delivering? Was it the fact that you can uh, process so much more data, um, the important, the significant change that, that, uh, that caused their interest? Um, it's well, so there's always going to be some form of continuous improvement process. In the SMB segment, that's usually clipboards and timers. So they're just looking at um, pretty much the results, but not the contributing factors. They know how much they made. They know um, they have anecdotal evidence from the operators for if there are large periods of downtime. But that's about it. So there we're kind of removing that manual process and just giving them the platform where they can manage all of that within a manual work and just servicing those insights. In the larger companies, they'll have an ERP system and they have an MES system, manufacturing execution system. Those are usually still focused on the results but not the contributing factors. So I wasn't really clear about that maybe, but some of the data points that we're collecting here isn't just how much you make and how much time. We actually go into the nitty gritty of what's the temperature profile of the plastic as it's being melted through this machine. What's the amps or RPM of this machine as it's in the process? What's the laser diameter measurements of this machine of this product coming out? So we usually deliver a much wider data set, which means that from a continuous improvement standpoint, they can go that whole funnel from how am I doing to why to really solving the problem. So that creates a flywheel of optimization. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank Very nicely you. done. Thank you.